Hello and welcome to another episode of Positively Geared. This is Lloyd here and we have some exciting news today. Firstly, I've got to say that our co-host Alex is no longer with us. He has moved overseas, so not able to, to join us on any more episodes. He is an avid listener, however, and will be tuning into all our episodes, I'm sure. I would like to introduce to you our new co-host, Armando Ericello. Thank you, Lloyd. Real pleasure to be on the show. Really good to have you here, Armando, and we're looking forward to learning a little bit about your background and then obviously having you join us for discussions with our guests and all our future podcasts. Uh, I'd love to start, I guess, with you telling us a little bit about who you are, where you came from, what your background is, and uh, what you currently do. Okay, so I've been 26 years in real estate. I didn't always start in real estate, though. When I originally left school, I was a mechanic, started a first-year apprentice. Um, Dad always ran a small real estate business in the inner west. And after being in mechanics for about a year, I was always sick from the fumes. And Dad said, why don't you come and work for me for a little bit and see what you think? And that's how I started. Really good. So, um, yeah, so let, let us know or tell us a little bit more about, uh, uh, you know, how your career evolved um, from then, I guess. Obviously, we started off with Dad and that would have been 1998. Um, working with dad, doing property management sales, and we did everything with him at that point in time. It was a small business. Mum worked there as well. She was the first female auctioneer in Sydney working over there. And wow. Yeah, so it was very interesting times, and we grew up in a household. There's six of us, and we grew up talking property and real estate all the time. It was one of those dinner conversations that we used to have growing up in as kids. Dad would come home and tell us whatever happened in his day, and you know we used to listen and hear what was going on, and... I did work for him even when I was 14, 15. If it was back in the day when people used to come into the office to pay their rent, I used to write their hand receipt out, collect their cash, deposit it, and do all the normal bits and pieces. So you got into it quite young, work, working for your dad and everything like that. The six of you children in the family. So did you rent or did you buy homes for yourselves? Well, funny enough, there's six of us in our family and none of us are renting. Dad was very avid at property and helping us get into the market. So as one by one of us came of age, he helped us all get into the property market. And I remember when I left school and I was an apprentice mechanic and my brother, who's older than me, we got into our first property together. It was over in Ashbury. And Dad had originally had bought it and he handed us the repayment book and said, guys, this property is now yours. You need to pay the repayment. And I think at the time he may have put 60000 into it and he said, look, I need my 60000 back when you sell it because I'm going to need to help your other brothers and sisters. So, And that's what we did. We took over the repayment and we paid the repayments of that property. And when we sold it, uh, we, we gave dad back his money and he moved on to the next sibling. Well, that's a really good uh, life lesson for a lot of people, I think. Uh, starting young, getting a bit of education there, being able to get into that market. At the time, yeah. Now looking back, it was a great idea. At the time, I hated it. I just put my whole wage into that property and I worked a second job for spending money. I cut lawns and I also worked as a lifeguard at Canterbury Pools for a while when I was still an apprentice. There's a lot of talk around these days about... Uh, young people and, and first home buyers are uh, not really been able to get into the market. How do you think things have changed, uh, given the fact that when I first got into the market it was about uh, 2003, so uh, just over 20 years ago? How do you think things have changed from when you got your first home to, to now? And do you think it's still doable for people to do that these days? I, I think definitely it's still doable. Maybe in the inner west, you might not be able to buy a block of land, but definitely you can get into a unit or maybe something regional. But I think it is actually maybe even easier than before because people are staying home longer. You know, I was married at 25 and out of the home where a lot of people now are getting married much later, living at home until they're 30. And I think what they really need is a bit of a plan and to utilize that time at home to maybe buy a property, rent it so the rent can help pay the mortgage. So when it's their turn to move out, they've got somewhere to go. Um, One of the things that I talk a lot about in my books, Positively Geared and By Now, is some of the sacrifices I made when I was, uh, you know, saving up for my first property, uh, you know, such as uh, not going overseas till I was 30, not having credit cards and things. Can you run me through some of uh, the things that you might have been sacrificing when you were young and, uh, you know, buying your first homes and and trying to get ahead? Yeah, like uh, I still don't have a credit card today. So never had a credit card, never took out debt for cars. Uh, And probably the case was because we are paying off a property. So we didn't have that surplus income. We still went out. We still had a good time. I didn't wait until my 30s to go overseas. I think I was 21. But by then, we'd already bought something and we're contributing to it. 
Yeah, no, that's great. I think it's a really good um, lesson for people that particularly if anything, you can still have some spending money, but you just got to make sure you're putting a percentage of your earnings away in savings so that you are you know, trying to get ahead and uh, and not feeling that you've got to buy that, that newest, yeah, flashiest toy uh, Absolutely. You know, all the time. You started off as a mechanic. Mm. Uh, so when was your interest in actually uh, getting becoming a real estate agent? Once I went to work for dad, I did quite enjoy it. And I mainly went into property management at the time. And we stayed there. And then dad eventually left the business in, I think it would have been around 2008. And me and my older brother took over. And we, we changed little things and the business took off and we did quite well out of it. And, and I was there for quite some time, up until probably about 2018. I then went and helped another business in the city set up their property management. And then I opened my own office. And that's where I am today. I'm over in Campsie at the moment. Sounds great. So, um, and loving it? All going well? It all's going well. I think um, there's always something new you learn. So I've learned a lot in the last 10 years, I'd say. And property's always changing. Even the way real estate is, is done is, is changed from when I started. I remember people walking into our office, wanting to look at the rental list, and they would pick the properties they want to look at, and you'd take them in your car, and you'd go and look at three or four rentals, and then they'd come back and fill an application. You don't do that today. They all turn up at open homes. It's all online. So the, mar- the, the market has changed and the way things are done has definitely changed. Um, when we were uh, having a coffee last week, you actually used a, an analogy which I enjoyed. Uh, you, you talked about an example of someone buying a, a car versus someone buying a home. Do you want to go into that for us? Yeah, I do. So I'll have this conversation in the car with my son at the moment. So he's 16. He's just about to get his L's. And we talk about buying a car and buying a property. And the analogy I give him is this. I say... Let's assume that you're earning eighty thousand dollars a year and you've got an opportunity to buy a car or buy a property. And we run through both scenarios. So we go through if you buy the car, and then we go through if you buy the property and where you are in five years' time. So then we basically go, okay, well, in five years' time we've we've spent sixty thousand dollars on a car. What's the car worth in five years' time? It's worth thirty thousand dollars. So you've lost thirty thousand dollars plus the repayments you've probably put into it. Then we might go and look at a property and say, well, how much have you paid off that property in five years and how much has it gone up? And we're just using, you know, rough numbers. And he goes, oh, well, that's probably gone up another $40,000. So now you have $90,000, you have $100,000 now, as opposed to the guy who's lost 30. And I think it's a good analogy for young people to see how important it is to put your money in the right spot. I think that's excellent because I, I think actually being able to explain that and, you know, sort of physically showing someone about, you know, the difference there of something that really does depreciate and something that does, uh, you know, go up in value, appreciate, because I think a lot of the time, you know, people just want something right now and they want to have the, you know, the, the latest new gadget now. But I think people do need to sort of have that little bit of delayed gratification uh, so that they can get ahead. And that it is quite difficult sometimes to explain to um, to young people. But I think it really comes back to, uh, to education and trying to get that through to people when they're they're very young, even like even preteens. I think it's really important. So they're actually growing up with, um, with that. Yeah. Oh, look. One of the things I learned in your book, Lloyd, was have a plan. I think even as when I was younger, what what was the plan? How were we getting into property? How were we buying a home? And I don't think we ask ourselves that question. We don't sort of think about it for our children as much. And I think it's really important to have some sort of plan to say where are they going to live when they leave home and how they're going to get there. And just that little bit of planning can make a huge difference. Yeah, I think that's really important, Amanda, because even with my wife and I, we've got, you know, obviously a lot of properties and I even wrote about it in the book about you know, a couple of properties that I've sort of bought that I've kind of you know, bought for our kids. But really, uh, I guess our kids will get all our properties eventually. But what I'm really planning to do is that when the kids are old enough is that um, I'm going to help them buy a property. I'm not just going to give them a property, but they're going to actually learn the tools on how to buy um, how to buy a property. So, you know, if they save a bit of money, I'll help them, um, you know, with the finance for it. Or they might have a job, they'll finance the property, I'll help them with a deposit and vice versa. So they're actually learning how to, to get into the market, how to leverage the property, what it means to get growth in the property and how to manufacture some growth. Uh, might get them, you know, onto the tools or do a bit of a renovation of some sort. Uh, so they actually learn from there so they're not just getting everything handed on the platter and I think that uh, education type thing really needs to start from a from a really young age so they really understand how they can get ahead in life absolutely I think so and talking about getting on the tools my dad renovated 39 properties over his life and whenever he needed a, um, a laborer and we were still at home we were it so we do we did learn a lot right but you know those skills have helped me later on in life I've just finished a renovation the home I'm living now and it made the whole process a lot easier. And some of it I quite enjoy today. That's, um, that's really interesting to hear all that. So um, where are your skills? And, uh, and more to the point, where do you see value in a home when you're renovating it? 
I think you should always look and value it at home. I think land's always important. And looking at the suburb and what generally people want out of that suburb, I know you cover this in your book as well, but it's important. If you're building a home or renovating a home, you want to make sure it's to the flavour of the people that are going to buy in that suburb. So, you know, if they're all young families, there's no point building a four-bedroom home. But if they're all families, you're going to need at least a three-bedroom home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things I talk about a lot. And, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got you know, large families living in an area, you're not going to buy a two-bedroom apartment either. So I think that, uh, you know, the type of property you're buying for the demographics is really important. But also, what about when you're doing your renovation inside the home, where do you see that's going to give the most value to, uh, you know, to the property? I think presentation is still a key factor and a, a good layout. So if you muck up your layout, it's going to cost you at the end. So you've got to make sure you're good flowing living areas because what people are really after today is entertaining areas. Everyone expects to have a nice kitchen, a nice bathroom, but it's the entertaining areas they want. You want a nice alfresco area or barbecue it might be, a nice gardens. I think they're all very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's, it's, it's really good to have you as a, as a co-host on Positively Geared. I'm really looking forward to some of the uh, in-depth discussions that we're going to be able to have. Just one of the things, obviously, you're out in the market at the moment and you're a, a buyer's agent. So you get to go visit all the real estate agency, all the homes where I'm only probably limited to the ones that I have. Where do you see the market going at the moment? There's definitely some positive sentiment around at the moment, particularly with the uh, Reserve Bank, the RBA. It uh, looks like the interest rates are stabilising. There's now talk that there may be two rate reductions this year, uh, maybe one as early as May or June, which is uh, certainly something that wasn't forecast before. So that's provided some certainly positive sentiment around the you know, the Sydney and, and Brisbane markets. Definitely seeing some some, you know, some action around there. There's a lot of hype around um, Brisbane, of course, with the excitement with the you know, the Olympics and uh, and things that are coming there, the infrastructure that's going in. Uh, I, I think you know across the country, people need to be a little bit careful around um, the Perth market. There's massive hype around there, but it's also at the very top of the cycle. And uh, I'm just wondering how much longer that's going to go for before it starts to come back. Never a good idea to be buying it at the top of the the cycle, but you never know really know when you're at the top until it starts to come back. So probably need to be a little bit careful around there and. Uh, getting to Perth market might have been sort of a better opportunity you know, 12, 12 months ago rather than you know, right at this point. But in terms of you know, where we are locally in, in Sydney, uh, what I'm seeing is that you know, the listings are starting to pick up, but there has been uh, probably a lack of listings over the last six months uh, as vendors sort of hold off. Uh, probably waiting to see if they can get a better price um, on their properties, but there's still buyers around, uh, so there's, uh, it's still been quite competitive, you know, to get the, uh, you know, to get in and, and, and buy properties and such like that. So, uh, so, but yeah, there's de- definitely action there. And I think as the year progresses, uh, we're going to see some, you know, some some good action, some you know, house price growth. And but like I always say, uh, it's not about you know if you should be buying now or when a good time to buy is. It's really about buying the right property, um, understanding why you're buying it, where you should. Be be buying it, uh, you know, the reason you're buying it and everything and making sure you're getting the right deal for yourself. Okay, so we're thinking the market's still, it's still fairly positive. We've had a little bit of a dip probably at the end of 2021 and now it's definitely seems to be picking up. So do you, do you think now may be a good time to buy? Yeah, so look, it's definitely a good time to be buying now, but like I said, any time is a good time to buy depending on what your strategy is. But I, I think that we did have another dip sort of around middle of 2023 and it started to pick back up. Uh, it is starting to move forward now, uh, but there's still opportunities n- now, whereas I think towards the end of um, 2024, if interest, interest rates start to come down, uh, the market will really start to uh, to move ahead again. So I think you know, trying to get in and, and you know, get an opportunity now uh, does make sense. So there's you know, definitely opportunities around, but like anything, you can get a good deal in a good market or you can get a bad deal in a, in a good market. So you really need to make sure you're finding what's right for you and uh, and understanding what market value is, what you should be paying, what uh, comparable sales look like so that you're you know, not paying too much for the property and making sure that uh, what you're doing does make sense for what you're trying to achieve within your portfolio. So if someone's out there looking for a home, what would be your strategy to help them buy the right property? So if you're out there looking for a home, I think you firstly need to understand you know, really what your budget is and go and speak to your bank or your mortgage broker uh, to make sure you've got a clear and concise budget there, understanding what the max of your budget is. Then you need to look at what your, you know, your favourite suburb is. Uh, where you want to live and understand what you can get for your money in that suburb. Now, I talk a lot about this in my book, Buy Now, where uh, I I recommend that people have three of their favourite suburbs and then three second 
tier suburbs essentially. So if you look at your favourite suburb, you might be able to get the suburb you want, but you can't get everything you want in your house. You might uh, maybe a slightly smaller house, or it might be a you know a duplex instead of a house or something. But if you um, for your budget, you really want to have that that standalone house and everything like that, but you can't afford that in your favourite suburb, then you go to your, your second tier suburb. So something that's slightly cheaper, maybe a bridesmaid suburb, uh, and and look at that. But it's it's really important to understand what you can get for your budget and and understand uh, what the price guides look like. If you're looking at auction price guides, if you've got a um, a budget of a million dollars, for example, and you're looking at something that has a price guide of a million dollars, then that's going to be outside your budget because those type of properties uh, will generally sell 10 or 15% above the auction price guide. So you need to understand what you're actually looking at uh, and you might need to then uh, actually look at properties that might only have an auction price guide of, say, 800000 to fit within your million-dollar budget. So understanding what the market is doing and actually getting educated around that is actually really important. Yeah, that's probably the first step to really getting yourself buyer ready there. So would you suggest some buyers, if they're looking for a home and they may not have their finance approved, to get out in the market and have a look and go to the auctions that may be in your suburb and see what they sell for? Definitely. So I'd recommend that you do get out and uh, go to some auctions, uh, you know, see the action there, speak to local real estate agents and, um, and try to get on their mailing list as well. But, but certainly speak to uh, agents and get an understanding on, on what properties have been uh, selling for. Yeah, I do recommend people get out and, and look at some auctions, watch some auctions and get an understanding of what properties are, are selling for and how auctions are playing out. And also speaking to the local real estate agents, getting on their mailing list, uh, getting known to the agents so that people know that you're there, you're looking for property and things and really getting to know the market and things. Um, the other thing that's uh, probably quite important is to understand that some streets will actually have probably a different appeal to other streets. So some properties will perform better in some streets than other streets. You know, if you're buying in a, a nice, quite leafy cul-de-sac, properties there are probably going to be worth more, may sell more than something on a, on a busy road uh, that's also under a flight path. So you may not want to live on a busy road or under a flight path. But those sort of properties may be a little bit cheaper as well. So you just need to really look at what your budget is and what you can actually afford uh, and get really well known. I think that's good advice, Lloyd. Uh, I know as a real estate agent myself, there's nothing more than we like that uh, buyers come up and say, can you put us on your mailing list so we can send them things? And as you know, most real estate agents will always have a chat and tell you what's going on in the market. So I think it is a good idea that you get out there and, and talk to a few agents and see what's happening in the market and see for yourself what they sell for. It really helps you with your with your homework because at the end of the day, I see most people take maybe up to six months to buy a home. Yeah, that's very true. And and I've often got clients come to me that uh, maybe been looking for a home for you know for two or three years, and uh, they're always missing out. It's because they're not really educated well enough on what the markets are doing, uh, and they're a bit frustrated because uh, they keep missing out on auctions and price, properties keep selling for more than uh, their budget and things. But it really does come down to uh, to managing their expectations. So. You know, that, that dream house that you're, you wanted there might be a bit out of budget. So we, we need to come back to earth and, and, and realise that maybe it might be a, a duplex or a townhouse in that suburb that is more within your budget. But it's about, uh, you know, understanding that, providing the comparables there so they understand what they can actually get for their budget. For some people, you know, buying a home even on a, on a good budget is still might be a bit out of reach where they want to live. So we then talk about rent vesting. Uh, and a lot of my clients end up um, buying investment properties instead of buying their own home. Uh, and, you know, I've got clients that have got really healthy budgets of like $2 million, but it's not enough to really buy in the suburb they want because Sydney house prices are so expensive. But for $2 million, you can buy three or four investment properties in areas outside of Sydney. So, you know, people do uh, end up doing rent vesting. Uh, rent vesting essentially being buying an investment property in an affordable location for yourself where you've still got the, the benefits of rent coming in, you can claim things on tax, you're still on the property ladder, uh, but then you're renting uh, where you want to live, where you need to live because it's maybe close to work, it's close to uh, schools and amenities that you want to be near and things like that. So that's also a good option for people. So there are several different ways to get onto the property ladder. And with their rest, rent vesting, would you eventually get them into their, their dream home? So that, that, that comes that back, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That comes back to the whole concept about why. So if you're buying investment properties, it shouldn't just be for the sake of just buying them. If you've got this goal to have a dream home, then you should be buying investment properties that can you can leverage off to get into your dream home. Now, that might be leveraging off the equity in those properties to buy your dream home later on. It might be the, um, the case that you would uh, sell a couple of your investment properties and use the profits to 
then be able to have a larger down payment on your, your dream home later on, which means you can afford to get into something. When I bought our dream home in Lilypilly, uh, I sold down a couple of properties uh, at the time uh, you know, to be able to afford that uh, as well. So so using properties as a means to fulfil your, your dreams essentially is, is really important. And, uh, and I think that's really important because for me, you know, a lot of people think I'm passionate about property, but really I'm passionate about the fact that it's a vehicle to creating that the lifestyle goals and the financial independence. So it's, it's really about uh, what property can do for you. Uh, and if you need some investment properties to be able to achieve the ultimate goals, then yeah, it's just it's a really good vehicle for doing that. I really enjoyed that in your book where you answer the question is, why are you buying this investment property? Because I feel like a lot of investors out there go and buy a home or investment unit, but don't really know why they're buying it. Their short answer is my piece, oh, we're hoping to make some money on it. But what are you doing with the money? Where is your long-term goals with it? I think that's a really good question that investors should be asking to say, why am I buying this home? It's so relevant because a lot of people, they'll buy investment property because it might be close to where they live. Now, that in itself can be a problem because unless where they live happens to be the best a place in the country to buy, then that may not be the right move. And even if where they live is the best place in the country to buy, doesn't mean it's the right for them because everybody has a sort of a separate strategy and things. But sometimes people might say, oh, you need to buy in this area because, you know, it's going to get lots of growth or they, they go to a Sunday afternoon barbecue and someone says buy here and whatever. But you really need to understand what you're trying to achieve. Now, if your goal is to build up some equity to get into a dream home, or if you're looking for a certain amount of passive income, then uh, you know you need to have those goals in place. If you if you want to build some equity to put your kids through private schools, or you want to sell down a property in the future to pay off um, some other debt and things like that, understand what you're trying to achieve, and then you know what, what you can do. Now, a good example is you know, if you've got a budget of, you know, 600000 and some people think, oh, well, I can only buy a one-bedroom unit in some parts of Sydney for that. That's all I can afford. The fact is, in, in a lot of other areas around the country, you can buy a good three- or four-bedroom house on a good block of land that might also have the potential to subdivide and put a granny flat on or, you know, develop into a duplex later on. So you really understand, you know, the highest and best use of your money and highest and best use of the land that you're buying. So, you know, really understand how you can best utilise your borrowing capacity moving forward because if you understand what you can do with that uh, and how that can help you achieve your goals, then you've got a, a myriad of things that you can really do. Absolutely. And obviously we, we're talking about plan. How long should someone's plan be for? Should they have a three-year plan for property, a one-year plan, or, the sh- or should there be multiple plans within that plan? I probably think there should be multiple plans. Uh, I think people should really think sort of long term, long term being sort of 10 to 15 years. However, some people make the mistake by thinking that if you uh, if you set up a plan now, you know exactly what you're doing for the next 10 years. That's also impossible because like a mortgage broker or a bank can't forecast exactly how much money they're going to lend you for every property deal for the next 10 years. There's too many variables. Obviously, your own finances can change, job factor can change, yeah, the markets change, anything like that. Depending on what the markets are doing, you can't just decide, okay, I'm going to buy a property in Sydney now, and then I'm going to buy one in Brisbane next year, then I'm going to build a duplex in Perth the year after. And so you can't get that specific. But what you can do is you map out a sort of a 10-year plan around, okay, I want to achieve 100K in passive income. Uh, this is the steps I need to take. I need to build equity through properties doing X, Y, and Z, and you'll include things like uh, renovations, subdivisions, duplexes, and things like that. However, what you then need to do is have a specific strategy uh, basically for each property you're buying, so you really understand how each property you buy helps you get you into the next one because sometimes people have a bit of analysis paralysis because they are too worried about how they're going to achieve goals over the next 10 to 15 years that they don't get started with the first property. And let's face it, once you've got a borrowing capacity from your bank, then you really need to look at how you can get into that, that first property. I'd always recommend that you try to buy under your borrowing capacity and you try to maximise cash flow on that first property so that uh, it gives you the your best chance of being able to move forward to another one and then that first property should be able to set you up well so you can get into the, your next one. When I'm working with clients, we always revisit strategy after every purchase. So it's not just about having one strategy, it's about revisiting it all the time uh, as, you, as you're mapping out that plan to, to achieve that long-term goal. Okay, and I suppose you'd have a lot of customers coming to you at the moment saying, we need to revisit our plan because we've had 13 rate rises in, in 15 months. So a lot of people's strategy may need to change. How do you find people dealing with those changes at the moment? Well, that's very true, Amanda, because we've, we've had a lot of that. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily a lot of that, but we've definitely had uh, people who may have had a positively geared property that is now neutral, maybe slightly negatively geared. Uh, and certainly, yeah, the initial strategy is now got to be a little bit different. So now we need to look at, can they still achieve what they want to do? 
will the time frame be different? Uh, are they managing with the repayments on their properties? Uh, are the rents high enough? One of the positives, I guess, alongside the uh, the rate rises, is, is that we also have a bit of a rental crisis, as it's known around the country, where yeah, the rents have continued to increase, uh, vacancy rates are decreasing. So generally, you can, you can really revisit rents and you know, put the rents up a bit, which help. Uh, but you also uh, you really need to look at uh, you know whether you can afford to yeah to, to hold that property, and I also recommend that people should go back to their broker or their bank to ask for uh, a reduction in the interest rate that they're getting on their loans because that can help as well. Yeah, sometimes people may need to look at uh, potentially selling their property if they're not able to hold that, but most of the time that really hasn't been an issue. It's just a matter of rejigging their strategy uh, and their plan to maybe buy two properties in a year or, or their five-year plan may be a bit different and might be like, okay, we need to hold this property for a bit longer before we buy the next property. So it's about rejigging things and, and it's always about looking long-term because really what, what goes up needs to come down. So we need to really um, yeah, keep that in mind as well. So it's, yeah, it's not the end of the world when interest rates have gone up. Uh, generally, we do factor like a buffer into it when we look at the feasibility and the, and the cash flow on properties anyway. So we do look at what the repayments would be if interest rates did go up. So it's kind of part of the forecasting. When I started investing, I was paying about 9% as well, which is even higher than what people are paying now. So things are starting to sort of stabilise now anyway. That's right. I think when I started out, we were paying a little bit more than that, 13%. And when we got a rate for 7%, we thought that was amazing. And that's you know roughly where we're back now. Do you foresee rates going down to back where they were at COVID level? I have this question asked to me a lot in real estate. Well, let me just have a look at my crystal ball over here. Yeah. And it's a bit cloudy this morning. Or maybe it's just the weather outside. But no, I, I don't think it's going to uh, go back to the, quite those levels. I mean, they kind of were emergency levels, I guess, during COVID. I think they will sort of come back and uh, come down a fair bit. Certainly probably not to those levels. I think we, we probably won't see them quite to that point but at those levels borrowing money became quite easy and I don't think it's healthy for the economy to have such low interest rates there because it made borrowing money a bit too easy for people and we don't like to hear about people struggling to to buy a home and and get into the market but we also don't want it so easy that anybody can just get given a loan and then when interest rates go up they start struggling so there needs to be that that happy place where there is still a bit of a test there I mean obviously the the banks still have that that buffer where their assessment rates about three percent above what they'll actually lend and things like that. Don't see it coming quite back to that. And if we move on to the rental market, obviously we've seen huge gains in the rental market as well. Have you seen that help your investors as well? Obviously it's helping pay their repayments that have gone up. And what about the ones that may have had a um, smaller mortgage and possibly bought 10 years ago? Are they looking now to buy more homes? They are, they are indeed. And, and I've actually had um, people who have bought maybe a home three or four years ago who you know may not have heard, heard from for a while and they've actually come back and said, yeah, I'm now ready to sort of buy another home because of that. The rents going up is, is a really good thing, you know, for, as an investor, not, not necessarily as a, as a renter, of course, but even with my own properties um, across the board, I've got properties in Brisbane and properties in Sydney where the rents have been rising significantly, like at the end of the lease, uh, when they renew the lease, they've risen significantly, which is good. And we've, um, and we've seen that with, with our clients as well. And, and even clients buying in the regional area is where cash flow generally is uh, quite good in a lot of those country areas we buy in, but those rents have continued to rise. And as interest rates have gone up, a lot of those regional areas have become quite popular uh, to buy in because uh, there's limited areas where you can get sort of positive cash flow properties at the moment, but you know, those areas are still you know quite popular. Just before we close, Lloyd, what would be, say, two points that you'd give buyers in today's market? Um, I think you really need to think about your long-term goals. Even if you've got a strategy where you're going to manufacture equity, it's just like you're going to buy a you know, property and renovate it to create value or you're going to you know, subdivide it to create equity, you still need to look at your long term. So it's not about just a quick a quick return. You really need to look at uh, you know, sort of a seven to 10 year uh, time frame around that, at least sort of going through one property cycle with your uh, properties essentially. Uh, and I think the other thing to do is I think you really need to surround yourself with some good advisors. Uh, I think that's really important. So, uh, you know, I call it the dream team. And that dream team, uh, I think, needs to start with someone who can advise on the finance. So uh, like a mortgage broker. I advocate mortgage brokers because I don't think people should just stick with a bank because a mortgage broker who actually understands finance strategy. If you buy multiple properties, you don't want to just have them all with the one bank, but you want to have a broker who can understand what you're trying to achieve. Now, if you're working with a, a property advisor or a buyer's agent and a mortgage broker and an accountant and everyone's on the same page about what your goals are, then it becomes much easier to have the team working for you. 
essentially. So, uh, so it's important to have that the team around you understand what your long term goals are, uh, because then uh, and they will talk to each other. Your, your property advisor will talk to your accountant, uh, and obviously your your broker will make sure your finance gets through. And then of course you have your solicitor and and other people on your on your dream team as well. So those things are, are really important. Amanda, amongst all the stuff that you do, uh, I know that you do a bit of stuff in the affordable housing space. Can you tell us a little bit about you know what you do there and how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So affordable housing was created by the government. Essentially, when the developers are building a townhouses or units, they're allowed to build more, providing they put it back to affordable housing. So what that means is that property they build needs to be placed on the rental market for a minimum of 10 years. Uh, the rent has to be 20, 20% below market, and it's means tested. So if you're earning $500,000 a year, unfortunately, you can't apply for that property. The scales are, are fairly broad. It's not for Department of Housing. It's, it's for people under rental stress. And we've been doing that now for four years, and I think it's an excellent scheme. So I know we have a development out in Westmead where there's 23 in the one building. I think it's also good for investors. There is very minimal turnover. Yes, the property is rented 20% below market. You do get the property cheaper when you buy it. And after the 10-year period, it then returns to a normal property. So then you could rent it for normal rental uh, current market price or you could sell the home as well. So that's that's an interesting point. So you could potentially buy the property under market value because they... Like I said, they, they they basically sell for less. They rent for less. But after ten years, it's going to be essentially worth more because within the first ten years, it probably will have minimal capital growth because of the nature of the property. But Correct. after ten years, you could potentially sell it for more. Yes, that's right. And there's also an, another added benefit that you get an additional ten percent discount on capital gains tax. So instead of applying the fifty percent capital gains tax rule, it's actually sixty percent for an affordable housing house if you've held it for more than three years. With it being means tested, uh, how's how's that work? What are the rules in place for that? Look, just to give you a, a broad example, so if you're a husband and wife with one child, your family income has to be less than one hundred twenty thousand. So it's quite broad. And if you're thinking it's a two bedroom unit in Western Sydney, there's quite a few families that are out looking for a rental property that can apply for this property. You do need to be an Australian citizen as well or permanent resident. So that is quite broad. Um, I'm just thinking about like, you know, because my background as, as a teacher and, you know, I've got quite a, th- a lot of clients that are, you know, sort of teachers and nurses and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, I think it sounds like a pretty good scheme to be able to help people on, on you know, that kind of income. I think it's a great scheme because one, the, the public purse is not paying for it. It's been basically done through the developers. Developers get to build a, an extra additional units and that's what they like to do. They're good at building units or townhouses. So I think it's a good scheme. And where, what, what's council areas at the moment? What local government areas are they mostly um, being built? They seem to be built in the inner west and west of Sydney because it just makes sense because... If you use Double Bay as an example and you built a um, two-bedroom unit in Double Bay that rent for $1,500 a week, even for a 20% discount, people on 120000 couldn't afford it. So it, it seems to be moved further out west because it's just where it, it seems to be affordable. Are they apartments buildings? They're not like houses? Um, they can be houses. I have got a duplex that was built like that. I've got some townhouses that are built like that. But predominantly, though, they do seem to be units. Yep. Looking at what you do, you've done a lot of renovations in the past. Have you been hands-on on all those renovations? Uh, I haven't actually um, particularly been hands-on myself. Uh, I've renovated, uh, so for example, a couple of the properties of mine in Queensland that I renovated, I just had you know, tradies in to do that. Uh, obviously, from with the distance thing, I even got sort of you know, painters in and stuff to do the uh, yeah, to do the work. But yeah, generally not hands-on, but just sort of managing. I guess you know, my skill set there is in sort of managing and, um, and also, uh, yeah, getting the, I guess, the adequate pricing, you know, getting the right sort of quotes and stuff. Yeah, so you talk about your dream team. Um, is it harder to form that dream team when you're buying in the state? Uh, the dream team in general isn't harder to form because the basics of the dream team can still be the same in terms of your, your accountant, your property advisor, your uh, your mortgage broker and all that. Finding the right your build or, or renovation team can be a little bit trickier. If you're building a house from scratch, then you just got to sort of find a builder to do the whole thing. If you're doing renovations, now my renovations have generally been cosmic type stuff so you're kind of finding someone who's going to um, do some painting some uh, someone else who's f- do floor coverings you might find a chippy someone do a bit of landscaping things like that so they can be several different contractors so there's a little bit more management involved from that and finding the um, you know the right tradespeople who will quote well got a good reputation turn up do the job turn up on time and all that 
yeah, can be a little bit trickier, a little bit trial and error, and just getting the right references from, from people as well. In my experience, I found property managers a good source of finding tradespeople too. So I, I know myself, I've done cosmetic renovations for landlords, and I do generally find it's easier for me to ring my plumber who gets lots of my work to say, hey, we're getting a bathroom renovated, we need new vanity installed, new mirror installed, and they turn up on time and I can get it priced to the dollar and it seems to make the life of the landlord a lot easier. Have you found the same experience? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So when we're doing stuff in in locations that are away from where, where we're based, uh, using the property manager is is definitely a vital source for that because they've all got yeah their own own contacts and things. And quite often, uh, if we were to research tradespeople in the area, the, the local property, property managers are basically using the same tradespeople. So the benefit to that is that if you've got a property manager, they can contact those trades, but also allow access to your property because they, you know, they leave your keys with them to access the property and stuff. So there's ways like that that we can work. And that's how we help our clients out as well who are doing renovations from a remote place as well. I don't know if you all know this as well. Some tradespeople actually block out days so they can do their real estate work as well. So if you're going for your property manager, they may already have days available to them as well. Depends on the location, I think. So I don't think that's all over the place, but yeah. I found that in Western Sydney, like I've some have my tradespeople, they might get, they know they have to get to those properties for us. We can't wait three weeks for a yeah. landing to be installed. If it's a rental, it, it needs to go in and the property needs to be rented. So I think a lot of people... Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the kitchen and the bathroom adding the most value to a property and you should sort of replace the kitchen and the bathroom. So I think upgrades uh, are the best thing to be more cost effective. So rather than putting in a new kitchen, you could just put in new bench tops, uh, maybe a new splashback, for example. Uh, and in the bathroom, you know, maybe just some upgrades. Uh, take out the old shower curtains and put in some shower screens and uh, maybe a new bathtub or something. Uh, you know, do, do some tiling, but you certainly don't need to replace everything. Uh, and if you were to put in a new, like for example, if you you put in the new kitchen, you can get a caboodle kitchen for five and a half, six grand at Bunnings. Uh, you don't need to spend 30000 on a kitchen uh, like you would if you're putting it in your own home. So there are more cost effective ways of, of renovating so that you're you're spending less and, and making a return because I always try to get $3 back for every $1 I spend on a renovation. So if I'm spending 30000 on a renovation, I would hope that I'm getting ninety or 100000 equity back at least. I certainly don't want to be spending 100000 for the property to only increase in value by 100000 So you really need to look at what you're spending and how much value add that should do for the property. Good advice, Lloyd. And for those people out there that might have an older style unit, do you think it's worth their while to try and upgrade a little bit by maybe adding built-in wardrobes or a dishwasher or air conditioning? Yeah, absolutely. Keep in mind that if you're in a unit, there are some things that you might need to get advice from the body corporate for. So you can't just add air conditioning without some uh, advice from strata and going through the strata bylaws and things. Wardrobes and things shouldn't be a problem, but certainly upgrades like that, uh, you know, is definitely something that uh, can add some value and things like that. Yep. That brings us to the end of today's episode. Lloyd, I'd like to thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to our special guest coming on our next episode. And thank you again. Thanks, Amanda. It's been really great talking with you today and really looking forward to chatting with you next time.